So tell me when everybody is in and we'll get started. Yeah, we're just loading up. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Let's give it another minute here to let everyone join. It's Okay. Go ahead and get started. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our monthly scientist hour. My name is Sarah Kelly, and I am the senior development manager at the Retina Foundation. And our mission at the Retina Foundation is to prevent loss and restore sight through innovative research and treatment. Each year, we have 2,300 people come through our doors completely free of charge. We focus on three main categories pediatric eye disorders, inherited eye disease, and age-related macular degeneration. Today, we are gonna be talking about age-related macular degeneration. Um, and the reason is, is because we have a lot to share. We have state-of-the-art testing that allows us to determine the stage of your AMD. We provide genetic analysis for you and your family to help determine the risk of AMD progression. And we have a personalized approach treatment options for AMD. Today, Abigail Christie is going to lead our conversation series um, and Dr. Chalky will introduce her. But first, I wanna share why we started the conversation series. The Retina Foundation has an incredible depth and breadth in which we work. And so we are going to be sharing that in the space of AMD today. Um, we do not wanna be the best kept secret um, in Dallas, in Texas, nationally, internationally. And so we hope that you'll join us and also share the messaging that we have at the Retina Foundation. We have a really amazing group of people that are talented um, and Abigail's going to be highlighting uh, the different ways in which we approach that. During the presentation, if you have any questions, um, or during the conversation, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat feature. Abigail will be taking uh, multiple pauses to have a discussion and feel free to take yourself off mute uh, so we can answer any questions or feedback, or if you have um, any comments you'd like to share, we really would uh, appreciate your feedback as we want it to be um, a, a flow of conversation between uh, both participants and Abigail who's leading the conversation. Um, we also have Dr. Chalky on, um, and he is going to do uh, Abigail's introduction. Ab uh, Dr. Chalky is our chief executive and medical officer, and I'm gonna turn it over to him to introduce Abigail. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and thanks for the development team to organize uh, these kind of conversations. I think, uh, you know, all of us the, want to make sure that all of, everybody is, is, in, is as informed as possible about both what, what we're doing, but also more importantly, you know, where they stand, what, what they need to know about, especially in this case, age-related macular degeneration. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Abigail Christie. Uh, Abigail is um, a very talented a young investigator who has spent time with us um, both in the clinic and now is in the lab. Um, and uh, many of you all on the line perhaps have been uh, in the clinic with, with Abigail uh, and she's been intimately involved with uh, our uh, clinical um, efforts. And so it really, uh, my pleasure to, to introduce her and to give her the opportunity to, uh, to give this presentation. Abigail. Hello. All right, let me see if I can get my screen sharing going. And we'll get started. Okay. Looks good, thank you. Excellent. Okay, well, once again, my name is Abigail Christie. Um, I'm a research associate in Dr. Chalky's lab here at the Retina Foundation of the Southwest. And I would just like to reiterate again, I'd like to really encourage y'all to, um, to ask questions in the chat and to, when I pause, to ask questions. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the clinic with patients one-on-one, -on -one, and um, I, I really enjoy patient education and talking to patients about their condition. So I, I just, I really encourage you to, to participate in the conversation. But um, for now, let's just get started. Um, my talk today is going to be about the novel approaches to the care of patients with age-related macular degeneration and how we at the Retina Foundation really personalize our approach to your care. 
just a tiny bit of background about me. I graduated from Tarleton State University um, in 2018 with my, ma with my master's degree. Um, and I also went there for my undergraduate. I liked it there. Um, I f and I completed my thesis research um, uh, working towards an animal model um, it, of human glaucoma in mini pigs. I was fortunate enough to join Dr. Chalky's lab immediately following my graduation. And um, because ophthalmology focused research has always been my passion, I feel very lucky to be here at the foundation pursuing eye research and age related macular degeneration because it does impact so many people. So age related macular degeneration is a sight threatening condition that affects about one that will affect about one third of people at some point during their lifetime. Well, it does not typically um, lead to lead to total blindness. It can affect your ability to, to see in low light situations, to drive, read, and the, especially the ability to recognize faces. Um, at this point, um, I think we have a poll for the audience about um, about some potential um, ways that we could uh, that you can impact your macular generation course, Vanessa. We have everyone just a couple more seconds to complete this and then I will okay. share the results. Okay. All right, the results Excellent. are in. Excellent, all of the above. I totally agree. Um, we really. <laughs> We really encourage our patients to, um, to, to eat dark green leafy vegetables. If you're a current smoker, absolutely stop. That can only make things worse and um, eat a balanced diet. Of course, there's lots of things you can't control, right? You can't control your family history or genetics, uh, uh, gaining wisdom by advancing age, your eye color. Um, but you can, of course, control um, your weight and high blood pressure, smoking, sun exposure, nutrient deficiency, all those things we're gonna talk about have an, have an impact on your age, um, on your age-related macular generation, and we think on your on integrative progression. One thing I'd like to point out here is just because we're briefly talking about family history and genetics, is this, this macular generation is not like cystic fibrosis or other diseases where we know there's one specific bad gene that causes it. Um, we, we, th we think there's a multitude of genes, and I'll, I'll point out a few of them later in the presentation, but um, there's a lot of people will ask me that um, because we do do genetics here, and they'll, it's just important to, important to know it's a combination of lots of factors that influence um, if, if you were to develop macular generation and the progression of it. Um, a typical story I hear when patients come to see me and are, um, when they come to see us in our clinic is that, well, my doctor said I had macular generation, but there they said there's, it's, it's dry, there's nothing can be done about it, so they sent me to y'all. And very little patient education is given to them. And I really enjoy to, um, talking to patients about that. And, but when they do go to their regular eye doctor the first time they're first diagnosed, often they're given a grid that looks something like this. A lot of y'all might have seen this before, it's called an Amsler grid. Um, they like to hand it out to um, regular um, retina specialists, like to hand it out to patients or optometrists, ophthalmologists, and they're, you're generally told to um, have this chart, put on your fridge. That's what I tell patients, put on your fridge, um, check it one eye at a time, about once a week, or sorry, about a few times a week, and just make sure there's no, no, no big changes. Um, but there's a lot more to monitoring your macular generation than that. And that's what we're really good at here at the Retina Foundation is personalizing it for you. Um, the reason uh, that we're allowed to do that is because uh, regular retina specialists, which I've worked for, um, will see anywhere from 50, 60 patients a day per doctor. But we here at the foundation see just a handful of patients a day. So we have the luxury of being able to take the time with every patient and talk to them about their condition. So while this is very important and we encourage our patients to do it, there's much more to monitoring your macular generation than just an Amsler grid. So now that we've talked about that, let's talk about um, uh, we talked about who gets macular generation and why, some risk factors. Let's talk about the different types of it. So here, these are called fundus photos. These are pictures of your retina, which is the, ba um, the back of your eye, the film in the camera, the, what, el what allows you to see. Um, so on the left of, of both of these pictures, we have, I think you can see my mouse, um, we have our optic nerve here. We have arteries and veins coming out of it. And on the left here is a picture of a normal, healthy retina. Um, in the middle here, you can see what we call the fovea. 
Um, that's the very, very center of your vision. That's the part of your vision that allows you to, to read, to recognize. It's very important. Um, and you can see here on the right is we have um, a similar picture, right, of a fundus, of a retina, um, but we also see these yellow, these little, little yellow dots scattered around here. Um, you can see they also started to creep into the fovea. Um, the, like I said, that very important part. And so when that happens, um, you can start to see some distortions um, in your vision. And also these, these, these yellow spots, they're called drusen. A lot of you may have heard that. Um, they're a hallmark of macular generation and we'll be mentioning those a lot. But um, this is an example of early macular generation as opposed to a normal healthy eye. Um, we're gonna talk more about the different stages, but I thought I'd just really focus in on what's normal. And then here, an example of, uh, of early macular generation and these drusen that we like to talk about so much. So here we have, once again, an, uh, an a example of early macular generation. You can see all these druse, all these drus in here. And here is a center of your vision. And then an example of intermediate macular generation. And you can see more drusen, it looks more distorted. And then, and then of course, geographic atrophy or wet macular generation. Most people who have macular generation will stay dry. What is dry versus wet? Dry macular generation so wet macular generation is when you have the growth of bad blood vessels that are not supposed to be there. We have lots of great treatments for wet macular generation. Um, we do not currently have a great treatment for dry, um, but most people stay dry. About 90% of people will stay, will stay dry with dry macular generation. Okay, so why is this so important and why, how does this impact what we do here at the foundation? What we really emphasize is that is your rate of progression. So because we focus on dry macular generation, it's really important to patients and for us to, to, to figure out is, is how fast you're going to go from early macular generation to intermediate to, to potentially, theoretically, you could go to the end stage, which is geographic atrophy, which is the total loss, which is, which is some loss of tissue um, in, in your retina that allows you to see. And so because if it, were, if it was going to take you 20 years to go from um, early to intermediate, and then another 20 to go to, to, to geographic atrophy, and you're starting this process at 75, that might be okay. Um, you, that might give you some comfort. But if, if we were to see that you were progressing fairly quickly um, from early to intermediate, we would try to intervene um, and, and, we, and we would try to help you with that. Um, there are so let's talk a little bit about geographic atrophy right here. I mentioned earlier that it's the loss of some of your retina tissue. And um, Dr. Chalky loves to say that time is tissue. Um, we know that everyone with geographic atrophy will lose more tissue over time. Um, but once again, it's very important for us to understand your rate of progression. And I'll, and I'll go over later um, how just exactly how we do that. Because we have very sophisticated tools here that a lot of places do not have. So once again, I'm just highlighting um, the, uh, the different options that are available. So for dry AMD, for, for, for geographic atrophy, and early and intermediate dry AMD in particular, there's currently no FDA approved treatment. Um, there are vitamins uh, called AREDS2. A lot of y'all may have heard about that. But what's really important um, to, to talk about for those is that they are not a, they're not really a treatment for dry AMD. They're, um, th there was, their, their purpose is that in, in the clinical trials, it was shown that this makes you less likely to develop wet AMD. It does not help your dry AMD. And that's really important for patients to understand. But so it's, it, it, oftentimes your physician will recommend it because it, it, it does seem to help you from, from going to wet, but it does not help the dry underlying condition. Because if you have wet, you also always have dry. And like I said earlier, for wet AMD, there's lots of great treatments available, um, primarily um, eye injections. So here at the Retina Foundation, um, I'm going to talk about how we personalize our approach to your to your for, for your care. Of, how we personalize um, our approach to your care for your macular generation. Um, we do lots of functional testing, and I'm going to go over each of these individually in detail. We have lots of imaging. We have some of the, the best equipment that that's available, and we I'll talk a tiny bit about our, our genetic testing because once again, this is what we really care about here going from this early or intermediate stage here on the left and your rate of progression for how, and 
to how fast you could potentially go to this end stage geographic atrophy. And at this point, I'd like to pause for any questions that might that people might have. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you talk about, you know, you can go from dry to wet and you want to prevent that. Does yes. that mean that dry is typically less severe than wet or can they both can they both progress into really, you know, bad geographic atrophy? That's an excellent question. So um, uh, both can be very severe. Um, however, wet macular degeneration, you can see changes very quickly. And with dry macular degeneration, geographic atrophy, we measure changes in months and years as opposed to wet macular degeneration. We measure it. It can happen. It can change overnight. It can change very quickly. And so it's very important if you were to see a sudden change in vision, like, like on your Amsler grid, you all of a sudden see a sudden change to call your physician very quickly um, because so, so you can get treatment for it. But dry macular degeneration is very slow. Is, is that why maybe there's not so many treatments for dry because of the fact that wet progresses so quickly that maybe scientists are like, let's, you know, try to treat wet before we figure out the dry because it's slower. Yes, that has a lot to do with it. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to go into some of our functional testing. Um, I, I saw some of some names I recognized. Um, so we might, we might have some people who've experienced some of this and they're welcome to type some questions in the chat as we go, but let's talk about our functional testing. So this is what I call our standard of care. This is the standard, um, a standard of care everywhere. Uh, this is, a, this is an eye chart. A lot of y'all may have seen this before. It is, um, there was a study several decades ago that standardized how vision was taken for clinical trials all over the world. And everywhere does this, right? You've all done this. You put the thing up to your eye, you look through, you look one eye at a time and, and you say, and, I, and I'll say, okay, uh, read every letter you can for me from left to right, all the way down as far as you can, right? And I count the number of letters you read and we record that. And that's done all over the world just that way. Um, however, we at the Retina Foundation, we, we go farther than that because we, we've discovered that's not good enough. Um, what we found is that when we do this, um, when we have people do this, there's, there's quite a bit of variation. I'm going to talk about that a lot going forward is it's not very repeatable. If I were to have a healthy individual come in and have them read this eye chart once a week for you know, many weeks, there would be a, a very a, some fluctuation. I think we say um, six or six to eight letters is, is considered normal fluctuation in that. And that makes it harder statistically to find to discover a difference. Right. And so we do more than that. Um, a lot of people with macular generation in particular talk about how uh, they have a lot of trouble seeing at night um, and in dim light settings, dark restaurants, they have to pull out a magnifier with a, with a light on it. Um, and we've, we, um, we have a way to quantify that. And a lot of patients are very interested when I, when I hand them, I, I, I always call it, um, when I hand them this filter that I'm going to talk about and I ask them to read the eye chart again because it gets a lot harder. Um, people have a lot of trouble seeing through this filter and we've, we've discovered that that's a great way to track the, their changes in their macular generation in particular because um, we, 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 it's what we call their low luminance deficit. So what we do is we have them read the eye chart both under regular luminance conditions, okay? And then they'll have them read it again, like on the right um, with, that, with, this awful, with, with this filter in the way. And, and I'll, I'll have patients tell me, oh, this is so much harder. And then we count the difference between them, right? So this is a patient, uh, th this, is, this is just some hypothetical numbers. Um, and up here at the top is a patient's right eye. This is their vision over time. And so you can see the top line here is their regular regular luminance. Um, so just under regular lighting conditions, how, they read, how well they read the eye chart with just their right eye. And here at the bottom is their, is their low luminance vision. And what we've, what we've seen with macular generation in particular is that their low luminance vision seem, it's, it's a better indicator of their progression and especially this difference is a better indicator of their progression than their regular luminance vision. And so it's more sensitive, it's a more sensitive thing, it's more, and it's more sensitive measurement. And so if we were to, if, if they were, if, if they were to um, show us a change in their vision, we would be able to track it better. And this is the thing, this is a, 
a program that I developed. It's very simple. And we, we're able to give this to patients if they ask for it, then they can see exactly how their vision has changed or remained stable in this case. Um, um, this, this patient has remained very stable over time. And it's comforting for patients to be able to to have, to have the data, to have the facts about how their vision is doing over a long period of time. So you can see here from 2016, from September 2016, their right eye, they read 81 letters, that's very good. Um, and then three years later, they were still reading 81 letters at regular, um, I don't know, regular lighting conditions. And their low luminance vision also remained fairly stable. 59, you can see it fluctuated, like I talked about, but it's, it's pretty steady at 57. And their left eye, very similar trends but you can see the fluctuation in it. But there's an even better way to, to measure vision uh, that, that seems to be more sensitive and more repeatable. Um, the, we have something here called quick contrast sensitivity functional testing. And this, was, um, this is currently only in use by us in Harvard. Um, we're very proud to have this piece of equipment and we consider it more real world um, because so how it works is the patient will I'll show them three letters up on the screen. They'll always be three letters. I tell the patients that. And they'll do this under one, one eye at a time under both regular and low luminance. So with this filter here, conditions. And they'll, and I'll, I'll be sitting here with this little iPad thing and they'll read off the letters to me and I'll just say if it's correct, not correct, or they didn't answer. And then it will, um, it'll record it'll record how well they can see because it's not only the size of the letters here, as you can kind of see here, it's also the amount of blurriness, how blurry the letters are. And what we found is this is far more repeatable and it seems to be more accurate than the standard of care. And so we're able to track, we're able to pick up changes in the patient's vision sooner than we would with just, with just the regular eye chart. We also have something here that we fondly refer to as the MIA, the Macular Integrity Assessment System. And what that does is how it works is um, you'll, I'll bring the patient into a room, I'll patch one eye, we do it one eye at a time, and I'll have them put their chin on the chin rest. And, we, and they'll come up to this machine right here and I'll give them a clicker. And I'll have them look straight ahead at a target and they will, and I'll tell them to, um, to anytime they think they might see a light flash, to hit the clicker. And what it does is it only takes about six minutes per eye. It's pretty fast. And it, um, rec it records how bright, not only how bright of a light they can see, but where they, if they, if they have any deficits. So if they have places in there um, where they can't see as well, it'll record that. And that's really interesting for us because we can correlate, okay, they have, um, they, they can't see as well in this part of their eye. Okay, what's there in their pathology? And we're able to, to, to really dive deep and investigate um, how their changes on their imaging correlates with their vision and their function. Another thing we found out from this Maya system is that it, it very strongly correlates with, with the, 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 this, the, easy, the easy way of doing this with, with just that low luminance filter. We're able to see that as the patient, as they have a bigger low luminance deficit, it's already picked, it's, it's also picked up here, which is just, it's great for us. It's 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 for us to have a. It's an internal control for us to know that this this is working. That we're able to pick up changes in their in their low luminance vision here, and we're able to pick up changes here. So because those correlate so strongly, it just gives us more information. I'd like to pause here if anybody had any questions about our functional testing. Okay, let's go on to the imaging. A lot of patients. Now, I, I received a question just to me. Oh, great. So why don't other ophthalmologists have this piece of equipment? Or why, why oh. does Retina Foundation just have it? Uh, so it's not just us that have it. This is typically, um, this is used a lot in clinical trials. Um, but it's not something you, you'll see if you just go walk into um, a regular ophthalmologist's office that will just be done on regular patients. It takes a lot of staff training. Um, uh, there's there's three. There's four of us that work in the clinic, and um, because we have because we work at the right Retina Foundation, we have the luxury of lots of, of lots lots and lots of, of job training, so we know how to run this piece of equipment. And um, yeah, <laughs> so it, it, it takes time, and um, it's a fairly expensive piece of equipment. Not a lot of people have access to it, and if you're seeing 60 patients a day, it's just it's not practical. You're, you're you're like for them, but for us, because we have the luxury of seeing so few patients a day, we can spend so much more time with them. We can really dive deep and understand a patient's rate of progression. 
Any other questions? Okay, let's move on to the imaging. This is really where I talk to patients a lot. So here is a, is a, a picture of a piece of equipment that a lot of y'all will recognize and some pictures a lot of y'all will recognize. This is our um, Heidelberg optical coherence tomography. And so what, how this works is, it is I, I kind of, I tell patients it's kind of like an ultrasound in that one, one still image, this is of your retina, the different slices of your retina. We look at all the different layers of tissue. One still image doesn't tell us a ton. Um, it can tell us, it can tell us a lot, but it, it doesn't tell the whole story. And so um, when, and when, when you scroll through these and you, and you can look at all the, the, the whole, the whole retina as a, the retina as a whole, it, 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 you can find out a lot more. But what we use this for is this is, this is one of the most important pieces of imaging that we take. Um, and the physicians really rely on this to, to make their diagnosis in addition, of course, to the regular exam. And so this top picture here is a retina. This is the fovea that we talked about earlier, the very, very center of your vision, this dip here. A lot of patients will say, oh no, what's that dip? Is that bad? No, the dip is good. We love the dip. <laughs> if, the, if the dip goes away, we really start, we start to worry. Um, but um, this is the dip here in the center of your vision, your fovea. And here you can see in this healthy retina, you can see um, the different layers. They're very distinct. They're crisp. They're clean. Um, and then down here, you can see this is a this is an example of um, a patient with macular degeneration. These are some these are some drusen down here. These bumps where my cursor is. Um, and what's what's wonderful about this piece of equipment is it's very fast. It's very easy. It's totally non invasive. Um, and we can do this on every, we do this on every patient every time when they come in the door and we're able to pull up side by side. Okay, this is, this was them in 2016, 17, 18, or of course, multiple times a year when they come in, we can look at, we'll look at them all side by side and see exactly how they've changed over time or if they haven't. And that, and I can also, of course, when I'm taking these images, a lot of time I'll, I'll explain to the patient exactly what's going on. Um, I, I can show the patient exactly their images and they seem to really like that and enjoy it. So how does this all relate back to geographic atrophy and macular generation? So there's several signs um, when, when the physician looks at, the, at these images that say they might, they might they have potential to progress to this. And once again, they can decide if they can decide what treatment offer, um, treatment uh, clinical trials to potentially offer them or discuss with them or how often to see them um, based on these images because we have such a nice piece of equipment. So you can see here, um, there's some changes going on in the patient's um, retina and you can, and we know that these changes could potentially lead to this over here, this geographic atrophy, this loss of tissue the, the, that allows people to see. This is another kind of image that this um, that this camera takes it's called a fundus autofluorescence image. Um, a lot of y'all might have had this done by us here. And why I really like this is that it shows it shows your the geographic atrophy that loss of tissue that we study so closely here very well. So you can see, um, if I remember right, I, I look I just looked this up. I think this these were taken 14 months apart, so not that long apart, just over a year apart. And on the left here is the first image, and you can see this black area here is the patient's geographic atrophy, okay? And the fovea is somewhere right in here, okay? The very center of your vision, so right now it's being spared, that foveal sparing geographic atrophy. And then on the, on the right side, you can see, this was 14 months later, you can see that it's, it's, it's increased, the, the, their patient's GA is increasing. Um, and the fovea once again is right in here and you can see it's creeping in towards the middle. And so of course, this is very important for the patient to be able to understand um, and we can very clearly show them um, and they can see with their own eyes how, how quickly it's progressing. But you can see here, these spots have gotten bigger. Some have, some have um, popped up that weren't here before and all that is loss of tissue because of course time is tissue. Another piece of equipment that we have here at the foundation that we're very proud of, there's only a handful of these in the country. Um, at last check, um, there was only two in Texas, the other one owned by the military. Um, it's very, it's called the Zeiss Plex Elite OCT, and it's, uh, but it's OCT and geography. So it does one more step that the last machine, which is another kind of OCT does. It also looks at all the different layers of your retina, um, but it also tracks blood cell flow through your retina. And so using this, we can, we can um, look for, uh, we can look to see if any parts of your retina are getting too much blood flow, not enough blood flow. And we can also 
see if there's you have uh, if if there might be some if some wet macular degeneration, some blood, some bad blood vessels are not supposed to be there, if they're starting to, to grow and develop. Um, and then the physician can decide the, how, how to treat that or, or not. But right here um, is, a, is a lovely example of, of um, choroidal neovascularization, or that's just a fancy way of saying the wet kind of macular degeneration. This is a lovely example of, um, of that kind of blood vessel that we can see with this machine. And once again, totally non-invasive. It's very easy, very quick. We can do it on anybody. And here is a great example of just what I just discussed. Um, so here you can see there's, um, if you look where my cursor is, so this is just the progression over time of, that we're able, that we would potentially be able to track because we have this very nice piece of equipment. Um, here you can see there's not much going on here. Um, it, it, there's a, there's phobia is here. But everything generally, there's nothing kind of sticks out at you. Maybe something, a little bit of something right here. But over time, you could see this right here. This is that new blood vessel that's starting to grow that could potentially um, lead to wet macular generation or a leak. And then here you can see it getting even bigger. But what's really interesting is that over here on the regular OCT scan, any of y'all that have had um, wet macular generation or had injections in the past, um, you may have seen a little pocket of fluid right here, which is, it's not seen here. Um, and so, if if you were if you weren't to have this machine, um, you and you were just being seen on the regular OCT, um, you they wouldn't know that this was brewing. They wouldn't know that this was here, and so they couldn't um, they couldn't factor that in with how they decided your treatment because there is no fluid to be seen here. And same thing here, we see that that blood vessel is still starting to grow and develop, but we do not see any pocket of fluid here. And then the physician can make their decision about how they proceed. This one is called, this is an, a, a camera that we call the Optos. Um, and what it does is it takes a lovely ultra wide picture of your retina. Um, and we use this to, to document any findings. If you have any freckles in the back of your eye, we can document those to make sure they're not changing. Um, and it just provides, it provides a much more, um, a much more, a much wider angle picture um, than, than the traditional fundus cameras. Most offices will just have um, a, a camera, and of course we have this too, <laughs> um, but on the left it shows, this is a regular fundus image, okay, of a nice healthy retina, but, um, and you can see how much, how, how it's much smaller field of view than the one on the right. Um, I kind of vaguely put this blue circle in to show the difference, but um, our, our optos can also show a much wider field of view. And just very briefly, um, if you were to come see us at the Retina Foundation, we we um, we would uh, we could potentially offer you some free genetic testing. Um, how that would work is we would um, we would of course get your consent to take to take a blood sample if you'd wish to provide it. Um, that blood sample would be totally anonymous. Um, the only people that would know um, the the randomized number and your name um, would be us in a filing cabinet in a locked drawer. We we take that very seriously, um, and we, so we would send that sample off to um, the University of Utah, and there they. They don't, don't, they don't run a full genetics panel. They only look at these 15 genetic uh, genes that we, that we think are correlated with macular generation. And then um, when we get the results back, we'll of course tell you about them. And then Dr. Chalky will take a look at that and see, um, and see if, if you have some higher risk, uh, if you potentially were to have several genes that made you higher risk for developing, the, um, if your progression of macular generation could be faster, we might decide to see you more often and it would just factor in with how Dr. Chalky treats you. Um, PQQ. This is just one of the one of the nutraceuticals um, that we um, that, that Dr. Chalky sometimes likes to like if he thinks it's appropriate. We'll talk about with 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 our patients. Um, it, it, so it's nutraceutical. It's over the counter. It's it's kind of like a vitamin. Um, and in in vitro, so in, in primary cell culture, it's been shown that it improves mitochondrial function. So that's a really interesting study that came out last year. Was that they they took um, they took donor eyes from um, from people who had macular degeneration, and um, and they they cultured some of those so cultured some of the retina cells, and um, and when they treated them with with um, with, with this drug in particular, um, they showed an increase in mitochondrial function. The mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell, um, and we think that mitochondrial function is very important for macular degeneration. Um, this is a case report that uh, Dr. Chalky and I published last year about um, uh, about 
And what this shows was we just thought it was interesting um, that you can see here, these are those OCT um, images that I talked about earlier. Um, you can see here, this patient has some nice, lovely druse in here. Uh, and what we saw was, we, th was, we thought it was really interesting. Um, of course, and remember this is only an N of one, this is one patient, so, um, so we just publish it as a case report, it's just as an interesting thing. Um, but uh, you can see here that the patient had these drews in here, and then um, he was, he was uh, started on PQQ, and then um, he, his vision, and these are his vision scores here on the left, and they, they improved, and the drews, the drews in went away, and he has this lovely, um, almost normal um, foveal contour, and his anatomy improved, and so did his visual function. And we just thought that was really interesting. So at this, uh, so yeah, so the age-related macular generation um, at the Clinical Center of Innovation, um, where, where Dr. Chalky is, of course, a world-renowned leader for macular generation. We have state-of-the-art um, testing, and um, no, no place, at least in Texas, I think, in the country, has the same um, amalgamation of of really nice pieces of equipment that allow us to really investigate um, your macular generation and to, to, to tell you very precise, uh, precisely your rate of progression. Um, we also, of course, have the genetic analysis that helps you, both you and your family um, plan and so to help you determine your risk of, of macular generation progression. And we really truly have a personalized medicine approach to, um, a, uh, to approaching your, your individual macular generation. Um, I, I'd like to encourage you to visit our landing page at retinafoundation.org slash AMD to learn more about us. And um, we'd love to see you in our clinic if, if you think some of this might be um, applicable to you if you have macular generation. Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up for any questions about the functional testing or any or the imaging or anything else in the PowerPoint. Um, this is, I had a quick question, but it's not, it may be off topic. So okay. Maybe. No. Um, do you know what opinion or do you have any thoughts on whether exposure to LED light or blue light has an impact on macular degeneration and its progression? I I am not personally familiar with that. Um, Dr. Chalky, would you like to jump in with that? I just, I don't yeah. want to, yeah. So, so um, you know, th there is some data to suggest that at least sunlight exposure, originally we thought that sunlight exposure was not a big risk, but it probably does have some degree um, uh, of risk. Um, you know, whether LED lights per se uh, also um, have that similar uh, issue is unclear. What we do know in general, it's kind of interesting that, you know, the retina, even though it's a tissue that wants to see, uh, it really enjoys being in the dark uh, more than it enjoys being in the light. Uh, and when you look at, interestingly, some other inherited retinal diseases like Stargardt's disease, um, if you look at uh, the effects of light on those, um, um, you know, we have animal models of that disease. Light is, in fact, very toxic. And in fact, some of the models of macro degeneration animals are where you expose animals to excessive light. So it's clear that, that you know, while we see in the light, and that's what we do during the day, um, we really want to make sure that we uh, give our retinas uh, enough time in the dark to kind of heal itself and recapitulate. And so whether or not excessive light, like with a very bright LED, um, has any effect is unclear. What is clear, as you heard Abigail say, let's say though, that especially in, in macular degeneration and other diseases, uh, sometimes people need additional light uh, just to see. So, um, you know, I would definitely not be concerned at this point um, about, you know, um, the, the, the LED situation, um, but clearly wearing sunglasses uh, from a lifelong exposure perspective um, is critical. And obviously we all know that, you know, we don't look into the sun or any of those kinds of aspects. So it's still, I, I don't think there's any data that, you know, we've suddenly seen a an influx of, of AMD because of the um, uh, expansion of LED lights per se. But, but light clearly is one of those things that I think all of us want to be cognizant of that, you know, we should be wearing sunglasses and, and, and avoiding uh, the very bright lights uh, when, when we can. Any other questions? 
that one chart, I recognize that was one patient, but that was pretty impressive. Is that something that is that chart? Thank you. Yes. And I recognize it's one patient, but is that seem like it's duplicatable? Um, you know, yes, it's an N of one, right? Yeah, N of one, I said know, that. Yeah, is that we also don't know if this is, you know, this is one of, in any, you know, exploratory, anything that we do, right? The real question is what is just natural history, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, the majority of patients um, progress, right? Um, but there are patients who can spontaneously get better, right? So it's always challenging to understand. I think the, the real uh, the reason that we published this was simply to demonstrate that, you know, if we could develop effective therapies and we have, and you'll hear from, from uh, in, a, in a later a discussion conversation, uh, our, our efforts at developing an implant to deliver drugs uh, to the eye. The, the point here is that the retina has the ability to heal itself, right? So that, so that there is, even though this is pretty bad disease, these are a lot of changes in the tissue. Um, despite that, and, and whether it was just the natural history in this gentleman, what, you know, we are exploring his genetics, trying to understand is there something unique in his biology uh, that allowed us to him to to basically recover, but what what this gives us is um, some confidence uh, that uh, many of these changes in macular degeneration are reversible, and I think that's a, a very um, encouraging sign and suggests that not everyone is destined uh, to go down the path to um, losing vision. So. I think um, you know we 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 are exploring all of this, and but this is part of what we what what we're trying to do. I had a question. Yes. Um, would you only take this medication once you have macular, or can you take it as a preventative? Yeah. So, I mean, all of these are nutraceuticals, which means they're over the counter, right? So they're, they're not regulated by the FDA. They're, they're simply over the counter medications. And I think, you know, it's, it's problematic. I mean, you can take, you know, we see lots of patients who come in with bags of, of vitamins uh, because they've read, you know, different stories about how, you know, bilberry and, and all these other uh, things can or cannot, uh, and so, you know, what, what we're trying to do, at least, in, in, you know, is to have some ability to, to look at this first kind of, you know, what is the natural history of a patient first? Uh, because again, there's, there's very little evidence, even the ARIDS vitamins, you know, we really don't know. And there's some efforts underway to see if you started taking ARIDS vitamins very early on before you even developed um, any signs of macular degeneration, it could that be, you know, helpful? Um, but I think it's it's you know it's a little bit like I said you you don't want to end up with with a bag full of, of pills right uh, that that you know every uh, uh, person you know on the internet is telling you that this is the cure for macular degeneration. And I think what we're trying to do is at least get some initial what we would call off label studies and then begin a formal a clinical study. Uh, to really demonstrate or, or interrogate uh, something like this. Uh, so this is the typical way that, you know, off-label, what we call, you know, this is not even a labeled drug because it's an over-the-counter drug, but we're starting to get some additional uh, information to suggest to us should be we pursue a formal uh, clinical trial to see if we really, because again, ends of one and, you know, off, you know, we don't want to make any big decisions off of that. So. You know, like all of all of we know in medicine is it really is going to take um, a, a large effort to really show that anything that we do in macro degeneration makes a difference. As we did with the Aaron's vitamins, it was really a, a large 5,000 patient study uh, that showed uh, it, it had some benefit in reducing uh, the wet form, even though uh, the initial studies with the Aaron's vitamins 
was that it seemed to help to try. And the interesting thing on the history, and I was at the National Eye Institute when they started this study, was the actual point of the study was to show that it didn't do anything because there was this concern that people would just start running off and taking all kinds of vitamins and pills and stuff. And to our surprise, there was a benefit, but not the way we thought, which was it didn't really affect the dry form, but it did reduce the conversion to the wet. So I think it's I think it's something that all of us, you know, who we just have to be patient and and do it in the correct way. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? There's a question. I, I just received a question here. Um, there's minimal treatment for AMD. Could you speak about the trials that you have going on at the Retina Foundation? Yes, absolutely. So um, we currently have. We currently have, I think we're enrolling for either four or five, Dr. Chalky, correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, we're enrolling in several treatment trials for macular degeneration, um, for, for specifically for end stage for geographic atrophy, and we have several natural history studies um, for, to, to, see, to see, and those are very important. Um, those are the unsung heroes of, um, of clinical trials because natural history studies show us exactly that, your natural history to disease, how, how you change over time. And it's important for determining endpoints for the treatment trials. But um, the treatment trials we have on, um, uh, I know we, per, um, it's for, like I said, it's for people with, with geographic atrophy. Um, and uh, if you were to go on our landing page, um, which I think I have here, um, yeah, you can find out more about them, but um, uh, if, if we could, if, if you were eligible for those trials, we could offer you um, travel assistance and, um, but they're, they're more, but it's, you would visit us more frequently than um, just being a regular patient. So it, it's a commitment, but, um, but how, how, how would you, how you would started with that was, um, you would uh, give us a call and we would, um, if you were a new patient and we would, um, we'd schedule you a regular appointment with either myself or Renee or um, Kavitha or Kim. And uh, we would do the full range of testing that I talked to you about. Um, if, if we thought it was appropriate, you'd have a visit with Dr. Chalky at the end for, for, an, um, for an eye exam, for full um, dilated eye exam. And then um, if, if he thought any of those were appropriate for you, he, would, um, he, he, he could present those to you as options. Um, but if you were interested in any of our clinical trials, that would be the way to go about it. Okay, is there any more questions? Okay, great. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, this is all a, um, a, a team effort um, from all of us. Uh, this is, of course, this is a pre-COVID picture. You can tell because we're close to each other and no masks. But um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this is, this is a team uh, team effort here, and we have we have like Dr. Chalky mentioned, we have we have a full clinic staff, and we also have a basic science division. Um, and I think we'll be hearing from one of our scientists in the lab um, in the coming months. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely tune back in for more. But um, yeah, and if you're interested in getting more involved with the Retina Foundation, um, uh, continue to keep joining us for the Scientist Hour. Um, attend an upcoming lecture. Um, the dates are on here, and um, we have an auxiliary. <laughs> Sorry, my light just went off. Um, we have a lovely auxiliary <laughs> too still. We have a lovely auxiliary that I'm sure development would be more than happy to talk to you about. And we have a full range of social media for you to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, all of those things. And you can learn more, more about us by visiting any of those. Um, and so if if there are no more questions, I'll hand it back over to our lovely development team or Dr. Chalky. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you all for joining. We, um, our next scientist hour will be focused on inherited eye diseases. So we hope you'll join us. It's on March 26th um, and we'll be sending more information out. So lots of exciting things happening at the Retina Foundation. So thank you everyone for joining us. We'll talk to you soon. Great, thank you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.